Welcome you all for the webinar series by ID, ID Alumni Center Bangalore. So as we know that the center provides a unique networking platform for both the academia as well as industries. And also it bridges the gap between the two through the projects of national importance. So, so in this today's webinar, we, we, are, we, we are to discuss the urgency to provide the clean water to everyone in the country and how nanotechnology-based solutions provide a remedy for sustainable, clear water. So our speaker is Prasati Pradeep from IIT Madras and uh, who received for his achievement National Civilian Award Padma Shri in 2020 for, for the contribution he has done for towards in this area. And uh, so Professor Pradeep is currently Adipak Parikh Institute Chair Professor, and he is also Professor of Chemistry in IIT Madras, and he is also alumni of Indian Institute of Science IIC, UC Berkeley, Purdue, and uh, his research interests are molecular and nano nanoscale material. So, in this process, he has published five fifty scientific papers in international journal, and he also his his uh, his inventor of one twenty patents. And uh, so he's involved in the development of affordable technologies for drinking water purification, and some of them are commercialized now. So his pesticide removal technology has reached about 10 million people in the country, and his arsenic removal technology approved for national implementation. So is delivering arsenic-free water to about 1.3 million people every day. So that's a congratulations to Professor Pradeep. And uh, he's recipient of several awards. So few of them I'm going to mention. Uh, one is Shanti Saru Bhatnagar uh, Prize, then BM Birla Science Prize, National Award for Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, India Nanotech Inno Innovation Award. And he has also received the fellowship, JCB Bose National Fellowship and the National Water Award. And uh, he has also won the uh, TWAS Prize in Chemistry and uh, also received the Lifetime Achievement Research Award from IIT Madras and also the Distinguished Alumnus Award from NISC. So he's fellow of all the academies in India, all the science and engineering academies, and also international academies like TWAS, American Association for the Advancement, Advancement of Science and the African Academy of Sciences. So he has also written several textbooks and also on editorial board of various international journal. And as part of the philanthropy, he supports a school in his village where 500 students are on roll. So it's incredible achievement. And so today's talk will be moderated by Professor Praveen C. Ram Murthy. So who has received his PhD from Clemson University, USA. And uh, he worked after his PhD, he worked as an R&D engineer in Thermodisk, Ohio, USA, and also the research scientist in Hoko Scientific, USA. And after that, he joined IAC, and he is currently a professor in the Department of Materials Engineering. And his research is focused on uh, organic electronics and also the sensing of volatile organic compounds, heavy metal ions, nitrate, and biosensors. And he has published 270 papers in international journal and also he's, he owns the 21 patents. So today's webinar will be co-hosted by Dr. Sushila Venkatraman and myself. And uh, for audience, you please post your questions in Q&A box and that will be taken during the discussion time uh, between the talk. So, uh, so Professor Pradeep, over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. It's always a pleasure to talk about one science, especially the work on water. I work on several things, and this, this is one of my major activities. I must thank IIT ACB for this hosting webinar. And thank you for this kind introduction. Let me also thank my dear friend, Professor Praveen Ramurthy, 
uh, for co-hosting. I chose to talk about water. For a, a material scientist, water is a very complex thing. In fact, it is very poorly understood even today. And therefore, a large number of papers come or are being published on this topic every year. And some of them are really suggesting unknown things about water. If you get into the condensed state of I water. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Sorry, this is a problem. It's OK. If you get into the condensed phase of water, that is ice, again, there are very many excitements. In fact, the subject of water and ice, the subject of material science of water, is attracting a lot of attention and which we pursue in our laboratory as well with sophisticated advanced tools of surface science and spectroscopy. But I chose to talk about affordable clean water being delivered through advanced materials, which are largely nanomaterials. And this subject uh, at IIT Madras is, well, about 22, 23 years old. And in that process, uh, several things have come out, including some companies. So when we start thinking about water, uh, the picture that comes to my mind is this well-known environmentally significant picture called the pale blue dot. The pale blue dot was taken by the Apollo. The Apollo, when it went, uh, I'm sorry, it was sent, uh, taken by Voyager. When it, uh, I, Apollo and Voyager and all these missions were sent to explore the solar system. Voyager especially was sent to explore the solar system and go even beyond the solar system. And when Voyager went past the solar system, just about around passing Uranus, about 6 billion kilometers away, it looked back and took a picture of the solar system, which was fast sort of disappearing. And that is this picture called the pale blue dot. And in that portion of the sky, what you see is a dot that is blue in color. It is blue because it is earth and that is water. And therefore water is the most important inheritance of the planet and anything and everything can be said about water in the context of the planet from life and all that that you are aware of but today in this context of today's lecture water is is one unifying theme that connects the entire sustainable development goals in fact all the 16 among the 17, the 16 sustainable development goals can be connected uh, to what? Particularly, there is one goal called uh, sustainable development goal number six, clean water and sanitation. But there are many others like gender equality, poverty, hunger, and all that. They're all connected uh, to what? Closer home, if you look at the Indian water scenario, India is rich plenty of rivers, and these rivers, if you go closer, analyze them, which we monitor one of these rivers in Tamil Nadu, you find that this rivers, all rivers are contaminated, right from the source to the, uh, to the delivery discharge point. And of course, there are, can be many, many contaminants, 
But our objective today is to solve these. And you know, our dreams become reality with materials. Having said this, I was thinking about what picture I would give. And that picture I have chosen is the Jules Verne's uh, book, From the Earth to the Moon. So Jules Verne talked about sending a man to moon with a rocket. This was in 1865. The rocket was a 900 pound rocket was suggested. Well, it was built with aluminum, according to the book. Aluminum had been discovered, but it was not commercially available. It started its commercial production only in 1878. So Jules Verne talked about this great, well, advanced material of the time to solve one of the important challenges of, of man at that time. And therefore, of course, and throughout history, there have been many advanced materials uh, chosen to address challenges of the time. Water is no exception. Several advanced materials have come. So today, nanomaterials are looked at as solutions for, for clean water. Advanced materials are looked at as solutions for clean water. That is the subject that I wish to talk about. But if you start thinking about affordable clean water with advanced materials, there can be very many advanced materials designed for specific purposes as new absorbents or new sensors, new catalysts and new phenomena, ultimately leading to new devices. I may not have time to tell you everything in the time that is there, so therefore, have taken something from my own work. And I have written extensively about this in reviews and all to cover the literature in greater detail. But what is important for us to know is that advanced materials or nanomaterials today are atomically precise. And I took this picture to tell you what I mean by this atomic precision. So you take a small particle such as these that you see. This particle is composed of 25 atoms of gold. And it contains, it is protected with certain molecules. And this is synthesized in the laboratory. Avogadro number of these species are synthesized in the laboratory. There is only one species, one type of species in that bottle. So obviously you can crystallize that as you can see here. And how do you know this contains only 25 atoms or, uh, and with certain number of ligands? You do mass spectrometry. So advanced mass spectrometry as some years ago, people used to do with organic chemistry or even today, of course, many people do. This is now done on nanomaterials. So atomically precise materials are today there. And what does it allow you? It allows you to probe them in great detail with spectroscopy, very many techniques of microscopy and computational modeling to understand chemistry. I chose to study these kinds of materials with very many advanced techniques in the context of contaminants in water. So what was the purpose or what was the outcome of it? That is what you see on the left side. So when we develop these materials, which can remove arsenic from water affordably and sustainably, and I will illustrate these things or these terms, I will expand on them in the course of this lecture. We wanted to test them out in the field. So when this work was started uh, something close to about um, 14 years ago, I asked this question. And before that, I was working on some other topics of clean water. I was asking this question. After all, we develop materials for people. And these materials have to be most effective, 
most affordable and that should not cause environmental impact. So we chose to work on those materials, only those materials. And I had put a target that this material should provide clean water at a cost of five paisa per liter, conforming to all international standards. Today, these materials are delivering water at a cost of 2.1 paisa per liter, inclusive of everything, capital, operational costs, maintenance, all that. And I will show you, I will tell you that story. So this is how it was started. When these materials were developed, when we found that they are effective in removing arsenic in two oxidation states, arsenic three plus and arsenic five plus in water, with no, well, not excessive contact time, we decided to apply it in the field. So here is a cast iron pump. This pump is operating in Nadia district in West Bengal. And in that particular region, if you take water uh, from this pump and that water is falling on this uh, cement platform, what you see is red stain. The red stain is there because you have iron in water. If iron is present in water and that deposits in the form of iron oxide, there is a possibility that there is arsenic also in that particular region. So if you test it in this particular pump, it turned out that the concentration is six times higher than the national limit. Well, this is one pump. There are many, many pumps. It can be as high as something like 10 times or 20 times or 25 times, most commonly about 10 to 20 times in India. So we connect this device there, which contains these materials. You pump a stroke of this pump by this boy, uh, delivers 300 ml of water with less than a contact time of about two seconds, the arsenic is removed and you get clean water here. One stroke gives you 300 ml that means three strokes give you a liter. So it can be put in schools and therefore it has gone on to several schools across the country. And there are 1.5 million pumps of this kind across the country uh, in the affected areas. So, well, that is about that. But then of course you can take it to a larger scale as the community purification unit. These materials, they are, in technical terms, they are composites. They are biopolymer reinforced composites. So what we do is such composites are used as templates over which nanostructures of what are called oxyhydroxides are prepared. And this preparation happens in solution. So you have biopolymers, over which a metal ion such as aluminum, or it can be titanium, or it can be iron, and they are deposited as oxyhydroxide of this kind of a formula. And this is then incubated for some time around room temperature in Chennai. From solution, this is all in solution, you create a solid material and you can put water over it, and this material is still stable. So this is like creating material, soluble, from soluble materials, you create insoluble sand-like composites. If you study the Young's modulus of it, you get a value similar to a new river sand. So you can create composite materials as strong as this, but they are porous. In these porous uh, nanostructures, a porous, that porosity is in nanoscale, meaning about 10 to 20 nanometers. In this specific case, the porosity is 13 nanometers, one three. You put nanoparticles, and you can see them in a transmission electron microscopic picture. So imagine there can be many nanoparticles you can put. Imagine this is silver nanoparticle. Then it in water, it can release silver ions. 
and the concentration of silver ions is very small, something like 30 to 40 parts per billion, but that is enough to kill bacteria. And uh, it is below the limit of drinking water, which is 100. And well, this is nothing surprising, silver re release silver ions. But what is surprising is that regular silver nanoparticles or anything that you put in solution, the silver ion release concentration will come down because water contains active ingredients such as silicates. The silicates sit on in presence of calcium, you have a calcium silicate. This calcium silicate, even if it is one nanometer thin, the silver ion concentration comes down, this material is no more effective. However, in this particular pore structures, you can remove silver ions from the pores, but nothing can go into the pores and block it. So as a result, the scaling is reduced. Now, of course, the similar thing can be done if some other ion goes inside and it can be trapped as well. And this methodology can then be used for removing several ions. So imagine if it were to be silver ions, the live bacteria become dead. Uh, and this is a staining experiment that biologists do uh, to study whether material is effective or bacteria are dead or not. Well, when nanoparticles are used, even in 2000 beginning, we were thinking about if it were to be used in water, nanoparticles should not be leached into water. That can cause nanotoxicity. So we deliberately put nanoparticles in that water and the, these are E. coli bacteria. They pick up nanoparticles and that is what is seen by microscopy as well as spectroscopy. But in our case, materials are there, bacteria are put in, the bacteria get killed and that is what you see in this kind of lysis that you see in dark field microscopic images and spectroscopy, but no nanoparticles. So this killing happens because of ions and not nanoparticles. No nanoparticle release occurs and there is no nanotoxicity. So it can be implemented in the field and we do implement. We did implement. But then you can have a variety of other materials. So imagine this to be iron oxyhydroxide. Well, the material that you create, the porous structures that you have, iron oxyhydroxide, is very, well, it is not uh, highly crystalline, poorly crystalline. So you do get some tweaks in XRD, but in TEM you don't see anything. But if you irradiate for some time, you see crystallization occurring, and you see smaller nanocrystals forming, and these are very tiny. So the grain sizes are very tiny. And you do what is called electron energy loss spectroscopy and a few other techniques to study this. But what is important is that if you have an iron oxyhydroxide of this kind of uh, structure, you can put arsenate ion as well as arsenite ions on the surface. And you can observe this by spectroscopy what is seen shown here is Raman spectroscopy. So what you see is both arsenite and arsenite ions sit on the surface. Effectively, both are removed. So on a nanoparticle of this kind, you do understand where exactly or what kind of adsorption sites are there to remove both of these. So you can do a synthesis, optimization of the synthesis to create or to the best adsorption sites on the surface and a most effective material can be made. So when you do that, you can put take this material on a cartridge and you have 200 parts per billion of arsenate and arsenide combined, 100 plus 100. You choose 100 plus 100 because this is what is commonly there in India. You do test it out all the way up to 5,000 parts per billion uh, to, to see the suitability of the material across the world. But what is important is that this completely gets removed. And this quantity, about 12 to 18 grams of this, removes this arsenic all the way up to 12,000 liters of water. So you can develop a filter of this kind 
and this was then tested in the field. And we called it Amrit, or we called it Amrit because, well, because of the, the elixir, the meaning of it, but really it is anion and metal removal by Indian technology. And we implemented it in West Bengal in Murshidabad district. And at that time there was a district collector who was uh, ready to help. Uh, and this is the district and there are hundred locations marked here and we tested this out. And we also tested this out in community purification units in larger scale. So traditional purification units exist like this in a 40 cents of land area, very large towers with alumina filtration unit. Uh, and uh, you have about 200,000 liters of water going through per day. That is, this is 20,000 liters per hour. So that is about uh, 10 hours of operation, 200,000 liters is what we have. But a similar unit in 40 cents of land area now could be converted to three cents of land area because all these towers get reduced, not several meters, but now six inches or four inches in diameter. This is the input concentration. That is the output concentration. That's the kind of flow rate that you have. So it is comparable. It works. Even today, this is working. This was the first such unit. But then today, the modifications have been done. It is no more plastic and all that I will show you. So it has been implemented uh, across. Today, it is looking like this. From 25 kiloliters to 1 million liters, it is now the unit looks like that. And it is now government of India has approved it. And it is now going in several places. The cost of this is all estimated according to World Bank of India. It is 2.1 paisa uh, per liter. And then it is, of course, monitored. The water quality, quantity, pump performance and all that is monitored. And today, once it is uh, monitored, you well, after some time, this is adsorption based, no power requirement. Power is needed only for pumping this water, but material, of course, its performance deteriorates as the, uh, as the adsorption capacity is reached. So you have to change it. But then this is now arsenic laden waste. You cannot put it in the field. You have to develop protocols where it can be put in. But what we did was that we developed materials such that even after their useful life, the materials do not leach arsenic beyond the background concentration. So it can go back to the same soil rather than bringing these materials to Chennai or any region of the country. So this is one thing that we have done. The second thing that we have done is that we have improved this capacity so that regeneration, although it is possible of this adsorbent, regeneration releases liquids and liquid handling is a serious problem. So we increase the capacity such that these materials are the best in the world today. And therefore, instead, uh, even without regeneration, the cost is advantageous. So there are several other precautions that we have done uh, and we continue to work on this. Uh, and it has now been expanded uh, into many, many regions across. I should only, I'm going to close this, stop this for some time to take some questions, but then I'll take two more minutes to tell you uh, what is happening in the field. So when such a device is there, of course, India is so diverse and uh, one treatment plant is sitting probably 600 kilometers away from the uh, state headquarters. So it is important to monitor this. So today we monitor that. Now uh, with uh, arsenic concentration, it is difficult to monitor online today, but I will I'll come and tell you, I will tell you about the developments in this area towards the end of this talk. But we monitor the pump performance. We pump, we look at the flow, we look at the chlorine, we look at the bacteria, we look at the TDS, we look at all of those except arsenic. Arsenic is monitored every week. Uh, by the technician. So we uh, study these pump is, uh, or, or treatment plans are monitored. Uh, and there is this automation. That automation allows you to know how many plants are working at a given point in time, how many are idling, what is the problem with this, and what are the flow parameters. And this is being done today. This is the entire state of Punjab. Several of these uh, units are monitored more units are actually monitored today. 
I stop here uh, and take questions if you have. So these are the kind of parameters that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pradeep, for a wonderful start. Um, any questions? Uh, Uh, before uh, some people can start typing the question, uh, we ha I had a couple of uh, ones. Uh, uh, specifically, removing the three and five uh, oxidation state arsenic is actually amazing. Um, it's uh, use so much useful in the field. Um, and also, you touched upon not just filtering it out, but also to look at how do you dispose of this? It's not just a filter and throw kind of uh, uh, technology. So uh, that's been wonderful. Uh, did we also uh, look at or is it possible to see if we can regenerate this filtrate? Yes, as I mentioned, regeneration is something that we tried in the beginning and it is very much possible to regenerate. However, it produces liquid waste. Uh, and uh, okay. Controlling uh, liquid waste, of course, it requires the material to be transported into a, a, a kind of regeneration place. Otherwise, it has to be done in the field, which is going to be a risky uh, proposal. So therefore, uh, although we tried it, we decided that it is the best cost-effective methodology as well as safe methodology is to increase the adsorption capacity of these materials. So today, these materials absorb something like 30 milligram per gram, uh, and that is a significantly large adsorption capacity. And I should tell you that alumina typically adsorbs about four milligrams per gram. So therefore, it is an extremely uh, beneficial material. Uh, and if, of course, if you can improve it better, yes, of course, that is the research that is going on, but, but field, in the field, reactivation is not an advisable solution for arsenic. It is good for fluoride, it is good for something else, but not for us. Uh, why I was asking that question is, uh, there is absolutely no question, uh, the utility in a field of separation, uh, separating this out, but can uh, anybody look at uh, this as separation is one, but then you could sort of recover this uh, separated uh, metal ion. Some of them could be precious. Yes. Um, so high purity metal ions or metal can be separated. So that can be an added value uh, to the whole process. So uh, hence that question. Absolutely, absolutely. So therefore, uh, I, I take this question a little further. Uh, to say that it need not necessarily be a clean water project. It can be from wastewater. Uh, it can be from mining waste. Uh, and it is in this direction Sorry. that we have worked on and we continue to work on. And, and this is certainly an interesting proposal. So that is happening in the context of copper mines, in the context of zinc mines and things like that. Uh, but arsenic per se, initially we also thought so. Arsenic could be useful. But it so turned out that the arsenic, there is no utility today. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, just trying to see if there are any questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Sushila, is, can I see the chat box? Yes, I am seeing, but yeah, there is you no can. I'm seeing. Okay. In the, in the like... QA box, there are questions. Okay. Oh, there are questions. Ah, okay. Yeah, there are five questions. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, so the first question is Is arsenic the only contaminant that needs to be removed? Uh, absolutely not. There are uh, many, many contaminants that should be uh, removed. Uh, we looked at, I'm going to get to that uh, in the course of this uh, um, lecture. Um, but we initially looked at arsenic because it is since 1976, arsenic is known in the country as, a, as, as something that we should do about, but we don't have a solution. Arsenic in the environment is known uh, in, for the past uh, 109 years. 
So we don't have an affordable, sustainable solution, and therefore government of India was not in a position, wanted to solve it, but it was not solved. We kept the arsenic uh, level at 100, and instead of 10 parts per billion, we kept it at 50 parts per billion, because that is what could be solved uh, with, uh, with materials of that time. The international standard is 10. In fact, today, many people think that it should be brought even to two parts per billion. So this is where we got in. Uh, and that is why I, I emphasized on that. There are many others. We worked on all of them. Uh, and that is one point. The other point is that in the course of this implementation, we realized that it is not arsenic anymore. Uh, it is also a problem of many others, such as uranium now in water. And it is a shocking situation. So we have been in a position to address these as well. So uh, looking at it, country is becoming a hotbed for many of these issues. One may debate on the kind of developmental aspects and why this is happening, etc. but it is becoming an issue. The second point that I want to uh, come to is that it is no more a geological or geogenic arsenic problem in several regions. This is what I mentioned in the beginning. It is also anthropogenic. In the yeah. state of Tamil Nadu where I am sitting, there is arsenic and it is shocking. And it is because of anthropogenic problem because we have put in fertilizers with arsenic, arsenic containing fertilizers in the field. And shocking. Shocking because uh, this is the only type of fertilizer that is being used. So therefore it is there everywhere. Not just here in Tamil Nadu, it is there in Kerala, it is there in uh, Andhra Pradesh, it is there in Karnataka, everywhere. And it is only time, only a matter of time that it will come to get to us. It is getting into our water bodies. So we are measuring it. I don't want to alarm people, but it is important that it is becoming a larger problem. Uh, okay, so probably we'll move there on are, to the next thing. Yeah, Me, uh, I'll read out next few more questions. There are so many. We'll take few and then we'll take the rest at the end. Uh, the next question probably you already answered. Uh, Nanda Kumar uh, Ramnathan yes. asked, what happens to the filtered harmful material? You have already answered that. Yes. Uh, there is one more. It says, that's slightly funny question, but then it says, what else is still left in this research as a future researcher? So Absolutely. You, uh, plenty, you plenty of things. Uh, so <laughs> you will see that in the course of this uh, lecture. Uh, please wait for some more time. Yeah. Uh, next one is George Vargis. Uh, just this morning, we at our apartment had a discussion with the 3M representative on water filtration using backwashing. Can we look at your technology as an option? We need 50,000 liters per day. Well, uh, you need to discuss. Water is a very large thing. Very many contaminants mm -hmm. can be there. Very many issues can be there. So it is important to look at that specific water source, um, your requirement, and we can certainly address this today. A large number of solutions exist. What I just talked about may not be the right solution for you, but solutions exist. And next question, Ashish Chandra. Uh, this material is only useful for arsenic or can it remove any other metal ions? Well, it, this particular one was developed in the context of arsenic, iron, chromium, manganese, and now uranium. Uh, but it is also possible that several other related materials, related contaminants like mercury, uh, we could handle quite efficiently. So today we say that heavy metals, a broad basket of heavy metals, is what we address with this technology. But several other materials and technologies are there uh, from the lab. Ultimately, what people want is not arsenic removed water. People want clean water. So it, the solution addresses all of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, next, I think we'll take just a couple of more um, and we can keep the rest at the end. Uh, there's, next is Sahul Hamid. Um, is asking, using this technique, can we clean up 
ponds and uh, small heavily polluted ponds kind of thing lakes and ponds yeah so at this point in time it was used in the context of drinking water but we have looked looked at this for large flow rates and so essentially when it comes to uh, lakes or industrial uh, waters or or in the municipal waste, we are talking about large flow rates. So we have today looked at this only at a scale of up to 2 million liters a day. Uh, and a flow rate, something uh, of civil comparable flow rate. So something like per hour, we are talking about 100,000 uh, liters or 200,000 liters. Uh, this much is something that we have handled. So obviously, it is possible to handle at a scale, as you mentioned, in the context of rivers or lakes. Okay. So shall we move uh, on to the other take... remaining portion of the lecture and then take the questions? I... That's what I was going to say. So we will stop here. We'll come back and answer the rest at the end. Okay. Thank you. Please, please continue. Okay. So... Uh, I was talking about if there is water uh, and that is contaminated, say with arsenic or with uranium or with any of these, how do we address that by filtration? So we have addressed that. But at the same time, there can be very many other water issues, such as water is not there. So one way to address this is by atmospheric water harvesting. Uh, and this is still something that we are working on. We don't have the right, the most optimal solution. But I'm, uh, what you will see is a direction in that. So imagine this is a, this is a spray, what is called electro spray, uh, coming out from a nozzle. A, a solution is being electro sprayed. And what you have are tiny droplets you're seeing scattering from that. Let us say these ions or ions in this spray, uh, you can do mass spectrometry of this, you will see some ions. In this particular case, you see silver ions or in general, some metal ions. You can take these metal ions and deposit on surfaces and create uh, surfaces of this kind. These are nano brushes. And these nanoscale brushes are similar to uh, grass or cacti, the thorns on the cacti. So this can condense uh, humidity. So we have shown that it is possible that such surfaces can be active surfaces for humidity harvesting below the dew point. Now, of course, this can be done, uh, but why is that such nanostructures are used? We have shown in our papers that about 15% higher humidity, well, efficient humidity harvesting is possible with these materials. So this is called active water harvesting. By using these, we have now a company and it produces water uh, from 35 liters per day to about 2000 liters per day. But this is not an, a, a, a cheap methodology. This uses electricity. It uses the minimum that it uses is 220 watts per liter of water, uh, even in high humid situations. So that is about uh, 220 would be about two and a half rupees uh, per, per, of, of rupees per liter of water. It is there in Muttukad Lake and places like that. If you go, uh, you will see. But a lot of other methodologies are happening globally. The methodology that is happening globally is called passive water harvesting. Uh, there are materials of this kind which are porous structures. They are absorbing humidity. And when they are humidity is uh, taken up, these materials are heated by sunlight uh, when there is daytime. And the humidity is released in a closed chamber. And that closed chamber humidity level goes up above the dew point and water gets condensed and that can be collected. So the development here is producing advanced materials and such materials-based technologies are very much existing today. Uh, this is one kind of uh, solution. Another way is that let us say this water is saline, such as brackish water as in Chennai. So we have many regions where water has uh, salinity like 3000 ppm. 
to about 6,000 ppm. Not yet seawater, which is 35,000 ppm. But what do you do with this water, brackish water? One way to do this is uh, to remove ions is by capacitive deionization, especially with advanced materials. So capacitive deionization is a methodology wherein you have electrodes which are oppositely charged and the water containing ions pass through and then ions get absorbed on these electrodes, electroabsorption occurs, but the materials have a saturation limit of electroabsorption capacity. So when the saturation capacity is reached, the potential is reversed, ions drop down into the water and that becomes the reject stream. So by operating between production and rejection, it is possible to create clean water. Multiple cycles of this operation is possible. And there are several of our people who have done PhDs on this. And uh, one of them has started a company as well. So there is another startup company. There are several of these working. But what is so exciting about it? The capacity deionization has a rejection of about 18% in comparison to 55 or 65 uh, percentage for reverse osmosis. So therefore, this is one aspect. Another aspect is that capacity deionization, ultimately it is a charge is stored in that electrode. So that is actually a capacitor. So it is possible that the charge can be recovered. So that is one other interesting aspect. The third aspect, is that the reject rate, as I told, told you, is very much advantageous, but the power required is also substantially less. And that is about three times lesser than reverse osmosis. And it is possible, this entire process, uh, the charging that you do, the potential that is there applied to the electrodes is of the order of two or three volts. And therefore it is possible uh, to, to do run this whole thing on solar. And so we have implemented several uh, capacity deionization plants in the coastal regions of India where uh, salinity intrusion is a serious uh, problem. Kiosks of this kind have been put uh, across. So our contribution has been developing advanced materials with having larger absorption capacity and making devices out of these. And uh, today, uh, this research, of course, somebody asked this question, what is that one can do? A lot more advanced materials, lots, lot more devices have uh, become possible. What we have shown are advanced materials. Uh, using them, you can discover new phenomena. And these materials uh, can be used for clean water applications, as I told you, or disinfection or, or uh, metal ion removal or atmospheric water harvesting. I did not talk about catalysis that people can do, uh, or you can integrate all of these into products uh, using nanomaterials. Where is this going? This kind of science is going. You see, it is important to remove contaminants. You can remove contaminants only if you know what contaminants exist. So sensors become a very important subject area of research. Sensing is typically done, or, or analysis is typically done with spectroscopy. So this is a UV visible spectrometer. Many of you will have this kind of instruments in the laboratory. But today such spectrometers have become, can become something as tiny as this. So this is a company uh, which makes this kind of tiny spectrometers, the active units of the spectrometers as tiny as four millimeters in thickness. So when this becomes less than two millimeters in thickness, which people are working on, the real device looks like this, it can go on to a mobile phone. And when it goes onto the mobile phone, it is possible to collect the spectrum in less than one second from a right from a tap. And today with analytics, it is possible to detect or measure the concentration. So we do this uh, in Chennai. In Chennai, uh, several homes, we conduct field studies. And it is possible to detect many contaminants, not all contaminants with spectroscopy today. So water quality on the pipeline uh, become very much feasible. I told you that many contaminants are possible, but some contaminants are not possible uh, today with that kind of spectroscopy. 
I show you an example where advanced materials are making a difference. So here is a cluster, an atomically precise cluster we make in the laboratory. We make crystals of these. And this looks like this in single crystal diffraction. But if you take the solution of these clusters, which are soluble actually, and you pass it through a, a capillary under an electric field, you can create droplets, micron scale droplets, and which are charged, containing these clusters, and you deposit on a substrate, in this particular case, it is liquid water, you create materials of this kind. These are plates, and these plates look like this. There is, of course, a collection of these plates. So what is so exciting? These are specific surfaces, and these surfaces can detect arsenate and arsenite, in this case, arsenite, and you see the specific kind of oxidation that is happening. Even down to about 3.75 parts per billion, you get a big peak. So which means that you can measure even up to one parts per billion. And that without pre-concentration, directly from water. And what it means is that you can measure these concentrations and you can put it on a tiny device. This is a potential a stat. And this potential stat, this is a pocket potential stat. You can have, like a glucometer, you can have a tiny device such as this, an electrode, uh, similar to something that people might be using called drop sense electrode, uh, which contains these, and the data can be collected. And today we do this. And it is only a matter of time that such things get deployed across the country. So if this happens, obviously there are very many regions across the world where arsenic is there, of course, similar other things. So this is a very large global issue uh, that you see here it is more very high concentrations across the world. And once these are there, the right kind of solutions, someone was talking about another technology that is there, a basket of these technologies are also available. But it is not only about arsenic. It is not only about fluoride. It's not about mercury. It's not about bacteria. A continuous water monitoring is required. So this is one of our startups uh, at the International Center for Clean Water, uh, which measures water quality on the pipeline. And these look like these devices. They are put on the pipeline. And along with uh, this organization, along the Indian Institute of Science, has deployed several units uh, in Haryana. So these are the data coming out from the field. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six parameters. Many more parameters, 12 parameters are monitored today, even from remote locations like these uh, with solar enabled uh, such sensor units uh, deployed across. And occasionally we do get visitors uh, of this kind as well in such, uh, uh, such areas. So today that is monitored, not only by us, but also by several other uh, organizations across the company, across the country. This is a test um, uh, kind of a dashboard where you can see water quality. So this is one side. The other side is that it is important that in cities water quality is monitored. There are mobile water units of this kind by the same organization measuring water quality. I mentioned to you that uh, it is important to develop new sensors. So I told you about this kind of sensors, uh, which are drop sense electrodes put on a potential stat and measuring arsenic quantity by a current, which is arsenide to arsenate oxidation is what you measure in, in this. But this particular measurement, using a particular kind of, let us say, electrode materials, there is a whole range of such things that one can do. There's a whole range of spectroscopies that one can uh, develop. Whole range of materials can address uh, these solutions. But all of these will have to come under a policy. So only then a water quality installation of the kind uh, implemented in a, in, a, in a state. So this is the state of Punjab, which wants to be arsenic free. So we have contributed to uh, making that state uh, arsenic free, but we need to have policies put in place. So I'm coming to the end of this talk. Uh, 
to say that our dreams become reality with materials. So what is that ultimate dream that one wants to have? Today, it is possible that water can produce energy with sunlight, with advanced materials. The product of this combustion is also water. The energy can also produce water by desalination. It is possible, it is predicted, or it is suggested that one liter of water by 2030 could be produced with nine paisa using solar hydrogen. So if that happens with advanced materials, water will drive the world and in the process, clean water also will be produced. With this kind of many activities, we have built the International Center for Clean Water, which is a place anyone can come in and build a company around water and walk out of it with complete freedom. It's a complete open innovation ecosystem we have developed for the country and the world at large so that the world will be water secure at the IIT Madras uh, Research Park. And this work was done by my uh, students and colleagues. And in that process, they have built companies and uh, a large number of people have come out a number of organizations have helped us in this regard. And I'm going to close this with a short movie. So this is this movie uh, is done by a person called Suresh Menon. He once asked me, Professor, everything is great. You have implemented all of these units, but are they working really? What are these people, uh, you know, what is the real uh, field data? So I asked him, go and do it. So he did it on his own. So this is completely credits to him. And in this process, he traveled 8,000 kilometers crisscrossing the state of Punjab. And this is available on YouTube. It's about seven minutes. After that, we will take questions. Let me play them. The state of Punjab, we took a drive right into its heart and soul, deep into the interior villages. We were dumbstruck by the beauty of the green fields. All through our journey, we had noticed several blue-colored equipment in white cages right below water tanks. We exploded. We learned that these are community water purifiers installed at 97 locations across Punjab in capacities ranging from 25 KLD to 1000 KLD. Based on state-of-the-art nanotechnology, it removes iron and arsenic from water without electricity. It delivers pure water conforming to all quality standards at an insignificant cost of 2.5 by per liter. We tasted this water and let me tell you, it tasted so pure. This water purifier, incidentally, is called Amrit, meaning nectar in English. The groundwater in the state of Punjab is highly contaminated with iron and the deadly arsenic. Exposure to arsenic from drinking water causes heart diseases, diabetes, and may even cause death by cancer. I saw it by me. <laughs> Obviously, nectar is indeed sweet. We resumed our journey, traveling through rugged roads. You can uh, take the uh, crystal clear one. Mere school ke saath hi water supply ki tanki hai. Isse pehle jab je purification nahi laga tha, to bahut bache bimar hote the. Bache water bottle ghar se lekar aate the. There are no diseases at all, and sare bahut hi vadiya ne on water bottles di bhi koi zarurat nahi pahari. Hathre tikar pani honda bahut vadiya pani. Kangar bhi pindi ne, pande bhi pindi ne, janwar bhi pindi ne, bahut vadiya sosra pani janda. 
तो सारे बच्चे और हम स्टाफ भी खुद भी वही पानी पी रहे हैं और वो पानी काफी अच्छा है अपने घर के लिए लेकर जा रहा हूँ तो उसके पाइपलाइन बची हुई है कि पानी अभी रिपोर्ट भी करनी पड़ेगी दो टाइम लेकर जाते हैं People were emotional when they spoke about how these water purification plants had brought in drastic improvement in their lives and health. मैं थोड़ी कुछ कुछ मांग सकनी हैं? हाँ जी. अगर किसी दिन तो सी इस प्रोफेसर को दीप चिन्नु मिलो, उन्होंने क्या ना मैंने उन्हें बहुत बहुत असी सांदीनिया इस सौ साल जीन. उन्होंने वैसे भी अपने अगले दस जन्मा वस्ते पर थे नहीं असी सांदीनी किया जम्मा कर � The periodic water quality test reports showed us that the amount of arsenic in water is untraceable. It exceeded WHO specifications. The plants are cleaned once every 15 days through a process called backwash. When the nanomaterials which absorb the impurities reach saturation capacity, the active materials are reused. They are safely discharged and the state has arranged for this our job at encountering a mountainous stretch on the way to Europa forced us to halt for a cup of hot spicy tea surprise we saw the familiar water tank at the top of the tallest hillock in the area we were inquisitive <laughs> We then visited the largest plant in operation so far at a village called Chotriwal. It was a 1,000 kV plant delivering clean water to about 650 households to almost 4,000 people, 70 liters per day per person. We were impressed. This set us thinking: if over 97 plants could be integrated along with water supply schemes, the government must be hyperactive too. We reached Chandigarh to talk to them. बहुत अच्छी योजनाएं चल रही हैं ताकि लोगों को अच्छी क्वालिटी का पीने का मेटल रहित पर जो पानी है महिया कराया जाता है और उसको कंट्रोल करने के लिए IOT योजना के जरिए उसको हम कंट्रोल कर रहे हैं और उसकी गुणवत्ता को चेक कर रहे हैं। I am very very thankful to the IIT Madras whereby they have provided a technological solution where the heavy metals Like iron, like arsenic and others, can be removed from the drinking water. What was good was that the IIT was also willing to work with us on changing the prototype that we had, and they came out with a prototype of what is called the household uh, arsenic and iron removal purifiers. Technology was based upon the nano material, and it was a highly efficient technology, which is adsorption based uh, nano materials are used for cleaning the water. So intangible benefit of these things, in the terms of health, that's a direct impact uh, as an economic value over the life of the people. These plants are quite compact with high arsenic removal efficiency, as nanomaterials provide larger surface area. We understood that the common man centric government is very proactive and keen to expand on what has already been done. That was enough. Seventeen days driving, we took a flight to Chennai to further quench our thirst for knowledge. IIT Madras, the best engineering institute in India for seven years in a row, beckons us, the seat of life-transforming research. As we hang around to meet Professor Pradhi, a Padma Shri awardee, we take a glimpse of his laboratories. Science done here gets transformed. to startups and products such as amrit with the help of iit madras research park the first university owned research park in the country all of a sudden someone assured us in it is now clear that we can address all contaminants of relevance in drinking water affordably and sustainably in india and anywhere else in the world although the models shown here are for arsenic and iron We have similar models available for fluoride, uranium, chromium, mercury, and others. As we walk out of Professor Pradeep's office, we are in awe. Science, nanotechnology, infinitely transforming people's lives with water.
So I wanted to tell you that this story uh, came this far because of this great institution. Uh, when I had these uh, implementations, etc., related problems, piloting and all that, uh, Bhaskar Ramurthy helped me immensely, our dear director, former director, and all the people across the system and IIT alumni, and in fact, uh, every door was open because uh, there was an alumnus there in, in that office. So that is how this whole thing happened. And also because of our students uh, and some of our BTEC students uh, took this as their mission. And that they took this as their mission because their parents also thought that it is important to help them. So uh, one of them who had a software job quit that and came here and worked uh, on a salary of 20,000 rupees and built this technology, hats off to them. And it is because of them, because of alumni like this, because of a great institution, because of a great country, we are doing this. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Pradeep, for a wonderful talk. Uh, it's amazing, really heartening to see the research touching the people in the ground and people benefiting that. It's not just publications or patents and those things. That's 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 always wonderful. But touching the people, uh, I mean, goes beyond uh, just science, right? So that was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, as we were going through, now we have. The, your topic is so nice. So you have so many questions that's lined up. Uh, we will go through some of them. Sure. Um, this is uh, Srinivasan Sheshadri Simhan uh, is asking, can we do this when we have parallelly with uh, microbes and fungi? Uh, I mean, in the sense, if there is a sewage water present, can we do the same thing? still with uh, this filtration thing? Yes, uh, it is possible. And as I told you in the beginning, people want clean water, irrespective of, I mean, they just want to get rid of all the contaminants. So we can address these, uh, but in, the, in many of these uh, states, uh, when there is a water treatment, water distribution program, they take this water from a good source. Uh, of course, they want to minimize the treatment cost, right? So it is a good source. But this good source, as we keep withdrawing water, you start finding uh, contaminants. Mm -hmm. And that is how uh, solutions get implemented uh, for arsenic, because arsenic was not there before. Uh, and, uh, and as we go down, or as uh, the region is changing, mm -hmm. these are coming in. Uh, our own understanding of contaminants is increasing. Uh, as I told you some years ago, it was 50 uh, was the limit, micrograms per liter. It, uh, it came to 10 parts micrograms per liter. As a result, treatment became necessary uh, for uh, several locations. We were not worried about uranium. Uh, we are worried about uranium. We are seeing increased concentrations because today public is also aware of these. And it is important that government addresses all of these. So uh, coming to, well, uh, the sum and substance is that when there is a contamination, we can address it. We address the issue of drinking water, uh, taking the available drinking water sources in which these contaminants were found, uh, they were addressed. Now, if there are other regions where uh, other contaminants exist, we have also addressed them. Uh, but we did not get into sewage water uh, so far, uh, but treated sewage water we have addressed. So there are already existing methodologies for treatment of sewage water, but then when it uh, then the produced water contains metals, we use these technologies to clean up as tertiary treatment. 
there are uh, next couple of questions similar uh, one from satish shrinivas murthy who uh, has connections with handloom industry and he would like to connect with you at a later stage to see how right. it can be used there absolutely and uh, there is another one uh, vinod madhavan from uh, botswana he is uh, trying to reach out uh, to get this uh, technology to botswana to see if it can be implemented there so he would like to connect with you absolutely in gaborone there are there are friends there is some institution called bitri botswana institute uh, so one should probably try to connect with them as well i did uh, get them here and also to show them uh, what is there uh, but gaborone and, and botswana face several other challenges as well uh, there is no water at all uh, yeah um so some of these questions you have already answered like the cost of water how much per liter it would cost and things like that um yeah. many of them are asking for your contact details so that they yeah. want to connect with you yes. um, that is that and there are some questions on uh, arsenic in fertilizer um yes uh, the, how did it get into yeah. that, to that so yeah. arsenic is uh, is in the same group of um, as phosphorus. So nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth. So therefore, phosphorus is given in fertilizers and NPK. The phosphorus is typically given as inorganic phosphates. Phosphates are mined. And phosphorus mines, which are for phosphate mines, without arsenic, and this is natural uh, to present, to have arsenic there because of the chemistry is similar, phosphate and arsenic. However, the clean phosphorus has become, or phosphate has become expensive. So people went to cheaper phosphate mines and the cheaper phosphate mines have arsenic. So today we are forced, or because of the subsidies and programs of this kind, we are getting cheap phosphorus and that contains arsenic to the extent of even 5%. That is where the arsenic is coming from. Um, uh, one more interesting question from Dr. Madhu Ganesh is asking basically uh, how does this uh, molecule which would remove iron and uh, arsenic will interact or uh, basically is talking about interference uh, with some other metal ions. Would that affect uh, the efficacy so, of this removal? So this is a serious problem. That is why many of the earlier materials did not work. Uh, most of these regions containing arsenic or arsenic, they also have phosphorus. For the same reason as I just mentioned, uh, chemistry being similar. There is also, of course, carbonate and uh, bicarbonate and uh, fluoride and such things. So you also have interference. So that is where new materials had to be developed. So fortunately, in our particular case, and the chemistry of iron or iron oxides uh, for arsenic removal is also well known. What has been our contribution is the removal of these two ions simultaneously because of the specific site adsorption sites that we have produced on these nanoscale materials. So coming to the specifics, it is engineering of these particles. Uh, now, you can uh, have an older uh, particle that is well known, which also adsorbs, unfortunately, phosphate. As a result, you don't have enough adsorption capacity. So you can, I mean, there is also another challenge or another possibility, why not create better and better materials? Yes, of course, that's a possibility that uh, one could work on. But fortunately, these materials do work uh, today well. But I can also tell you that there are several things we don't have solutions for. For example, we don't have an excellent solution. Excellent, I mean, excellent solution for selenate. And selenium contamination in the country is also becoming a problem. Uh, so those who are hearing this uh, would probably uh, like to know, uh, uh, well, a subject area wherein the nation is interested in. Wonderful. 
Uh, there's uh, one more question uh, asking, uh, do, do you do this evaluation in E-Road, Bhavani Belt, uh, leather industry in Ambur, uh, just specific locations have you worked on is what the question is. Yes, uh, we in did, South. Uh, we, we did uh, uh, work on and uh, regions in Bhavani uh, River uh, Belt, uh, there is contamination. And in, a, in apart from these, there is also greater contamination of pesticides, agrochemicals in general. So we have been working on this. We have adopted a village uh, and we are monitoring that village and we have implemented solutions there. So this activity is ongoing, but then, uh, you know, great, more and more involvement is required. I saw just now a question uh, here in the context of um, Arup Senguptos uh, technology. I, uh, yes, Arup is a dear friend, and so there is a lot of um, work that he has done uh, utilizing uh, zirconia nanoparticles. There are a number of alternate technologies available, uh, and these oxide, these oxide materials are impregnated. Uh, in resins, resin beds. Uh, and that is also a way that uh, here itself in India, there are companies working on this uh, with such kind of materials. So a whole range of basket of solutions exist uh, for this. So what is most cost effective, what is most sustainable, what is most adaptable in the field uh, should be used. And uh, we certainly don't advocate one technology alone. I think that's uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. There are a few more questions. I think a lot of them you have answered uh, either during your presentation or answering this, some of the cross questions. Um, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful uh, talk. Uh, as I said, it is not just the technical part of it, the social relevance to the uh, work and you are uh, not just again a technical part the dedication in connecting to people uh, where water is the most there is absolutely no question but is the most important thing for uh, living beings so um, that part has been uh, amazing and uh, i am glad that as part of this seminar and then i could uh, uh, moderate the question session thank you very much uh, professor pradeep and also i'd like to thank uh, iitb uh, uh, Professor Rabha Mishra and uh, Dr. Sushila for uh, making me a part of this. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Um, you know, when we start the early, one of the earliest webinars we did uh, about three years ago now was with Professor Sitaram, uh, IIT Guwahati. And he said, he asked the question, is India... Um, running out of water or is water running out of India? Mm -hmm. And what he talked about was how what we can do to preserve water and what we can do to avoid wastage of waters. So that was his subject. In today's webinar uh, by Professor T. Pradeep, uh, he talked about what can be done to keep whatever water is available, how can we keep it clean? So that's, uh, it's, we're kind of moving forward on this whole issue of water. Uh, one of the things he said is that this is not just about technology, but is an interdisciplinary issue, which, which is a theme that we see repeated time and time again. Policy issues, uh, another example of an area that uh, is, is, is the question of what kind of fertilizers, what, what do we do about something as basic as fertilizers or, or things that contaminate the waters? How do we prevent contamination, just like Professor Sita Ram talked about preventing the wastage of water. Um, he shared his dream of providing, producing water at nine paise per liter by the year 2030. And obviously that would be clean water. And he started by telling us that water is the most important, important inheritance of the blue, blue planet, that is us. And we've done everything that is humanly possible to make sure that we've contaminated it and, you know, made things as bad as can be. Uh, but 
hope is not lost. And we and through the rest of his presentation, he talked about what can be done and what is being done, what has been achieved. Started by telling us also that all of the, the uh, sustainable development goals are related to water in various ways. And that is why the focus on water is so important, not just for India, but for the globe. Uh, India is rich in rivers, but our big challenge is uh, contamination. Contamination is not an Indian issue alone, and he, we, sh we saw that there are hotspots right across the world. Uh, he had set for himself a target of five pesos per liter to affordably and sustainably clean water. And today, he and his team have achieved uh, that at 2.15 pesos per liter. And we can only say thank you so much for doing this. He, he really described in detail the story of, of how this was achieved, the, the technology and what was, what was done to achieve all of that, to create all of that technology, and how eventually it was implemented in schools with, on pumps, and also in, uh, in a larger context in community purifiers that take much less space, so three cents uh, as against the 40 cents that earlier purification plants took which means 37 cents are available to do other things like producing power in a sustainable manner or, or helping us with uh, making us, with addressing our food safety issue. Um, at the heart of all of these, uh, all of this purification process are biopolymer reinforced composites uh, that give us porosity, porous materials, and um, the various, he talked us through various considerations, for example, how do you avoid nanotoxicity? What do you do about disposal of the contaminated filter materials and so on? Um, and again, the questions were also there around this. This while, while he demonstrated it and talked us through it with arsenic, the same technology can be used for a basket of heavy metals such as chromium, manganese, uh, and mercury, and so on. Uh, he, he really described in detail for us how these materials can be created. And, I, and that should be a big takeaway for a lot of the audience who have been attending this talk and for those who are going to be watching online at a later date. And then he talked about three other areas in again, discuss them in detail. One was nano brushes to harvest water through condensation. He talked about capacitive desalination and how that has a much lower rejection rate than the RO that we all use. So I can't wait for the day when domestic units are going to be available commercially and we can actually uh, you know, install those rather than our RO units. Uh, then the third area was what we measure is that if we don't measure, we can't do something about it. So monitoring the quality of water is extremely important. And he described for us the ultra compact, low cost spectral sensors, which have been piloted in Chennai homes. So very happy that it's being moved into uh, the consumer space as well. And then of course, uh, Professor Pradeep talked to us about the future. Uh, there is a lot of work required to be done, many materials that need to be created, many devices that need to be created. And of course, sensors, how they can be improved upon and what, what more can be done with it. So today has been a, 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 an eye-opener for, for us in many different ways, but also it's been a day of hope. So thank you ever so much for this presentation. Uh, Professor Praveen, uh, thank you so much for uh, being part of this, uh, uh, this webinar and helping moderate the, the discussion. Uh, thank you, and we look forward to interacting more and more with you over time. Uh, for to our audience, thank you for being here. Your questions uh, they they made enriched this conversation all the more. And please do look out for our next webinar.